You all know Fancy Farm, right? The event that was a few weeks ago. Yes, some of you are nodding your heads down in Western Kentucky. Well, I got <clears throat> Senator McConnell spoke before I did, and um, he referred to me in his remarks as this nobody who was running against Senator Powell, who was sitting beside him. So I had the chance then to get up and make my remarks, and I looked over at Senator McConnell, who was sitting beside Senator Powell, and I said, well, Senator, who I've known for about 25 years, actually, I said, Senator, earlier you referred to me as a nobody. I would like to introduce myself to you. My name is Jim Gray, and I'm the guy who's going to beat Rand Powell sitting beside you. <laughs> Well, Senator Paul did not smile at that, so, but we moved on. We moved on. You know, I, I know so many of you in this room, and getting to know you has been one of the rich rewards of the job of being mayor. You know me as your mayor, but I'm here today as your next United States Senator. We've had a lot of success in Lexington in the last six years, and I want to thank each and every one of you in this room for being a part of that. We created in Lexington more than 15,000 jobs, turned deficits into surpluses, invested in our public safety and quality of life. Just look around our city. By working together, we're doing projects like the largest infrastructure project in city's history, our consent decree. We're working together in revitalizing the old courthouse. We'll soon break ground on the town branch trail. We have a new YMCA opening in Hamburg and just opened a new Senior Citizens Center. We've done that by working together, building each other up, not tearing each other down. It's not been easy, but you've heard me say before that even on a bad day, I've got a great job, and I mean that. Together, we've been able to accomplish some great things. So why many of you ask me a lot of folks ask me, why would I run for the Senate? Well, a U.S. Senate seat is a terrible thing to waste. I promise to be a full-time senator and work just as hard for Kentucky as I have for Lexington because I believe in our state and the potential of our citizens, all our people. Now, some of you know my story. Alan, you did a nice job of shrink-wrapping it. I'm going to do a little bit. I've learned in this job of running for the U.S. Senate that you've got to be bold. You haven't met everybody, and so you've got to tell your story because past performance is the best indicator of future performance. I'm a seventh-generation Kentuckian. Spent half of my life, grew up in Glasgow. I was 19 when my father passed away. Left my mother, who was, at four, who was then 48, uh, six children. The youngest was six with a small business. She was advised to sell the business by her consultants, by her accountants or lawyers for whatever she should get for it. But we decided to hang on. We struggled. Eight years later, we were flat broke, insolvent. But with the help of family and friends, like many of you have experienced, we recovered and we thrived and over time have become the largest builder of manufacturing plants in America today. But I say that not to brag about the family or the business, but about the 20,000 jobs that we've helped recruit and build in, here in Kentucky. More than 20,000 people a day walk through the doors of plants built by Gray Construction. And when you think about it, a job is precious. A job gives purpose and meaning in life. Everyone in the world wants a good job. I work to translate those skill sets from business into government. When I came into the City Hall, we faced a $30 million budget deficit. We had a $350 million underfunded pension plan. We fixed it. It was described as the most effective pension reform in the country. We had a $20 million bust. We were losing $20 million a year in our health insurance plan. We fixed it. And in the process, we created 15,000 new jobs in Lexington. We made investments in public safety through the five surpluses that we've created. Today we're investing more in public safety in Lexington than we ever have in our history. Now why am I running? A U.S. Senate seat is a terrible thing to waste. 
There's a legacy in Kentucky. This seat was once held by a name that many of you all are familiar with, Henry Clay. In the, in the 20th century, it was held by people like John Sherman Cooper, a Republican from Somerset, who reached across the aisle routinely. He was the mentor to John F. Kennedy. Later, it was held by Wendell Ford. All of these people were always focused on Kentucky. I've been mayor for six years, and we have accomplished a lot together. Senator Paul has been senator for the same almost 2,100 days. Now, he's talked a lot, and he's been a lot of other places, like the cornfields of Iowa and the coffee shops of New Hampshire. But Kentucky deserves better. I've said that I will never run for president. I am here for the people of Kentucky to put Kentucky first always. Now, let me tell you what I'm for. I'm for a thriving economy that gives everyone, everyone opportunity, the kind of opportunity that my family had. I'm for affordable health care for all Americans. I'm for affordable education that doesn't put a mountain of debt on our kids after they leave college or technical school. I'm for equal rights for all Americans, which gives then equal opportunities for all Americans. I'm for keeping our people safe at home and abroad. I'm for our veterans and helping them when they come home. I'm for a balanced budget and tax plans that grow the middle class. And I'm for policies that help Kentucky businesses and citizens, community bank relief, investments in education and workforce training, regulatory reform, efforts to keep Kentucky coal part of the energy mix and a bridge to the future. Now, in terms of jobs in the economy, which everyone in this room was, of course, interested in, and everyone I talked to across our state, first, we need to build infrastructure. It's the first point in my four-point plan. I've learned you cannot shrink yourself to greatness. You cannot shrink yourself to greatness. When you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot. And if the top line doesn't change, nothing else does. Our 1% to 1.5% growth rate in America is not sufficient for a growing middle class. We look back in history. After the Great Depression, the WPA program, the Civilian Conservation Corps. We put America to work. We have always grown ourselves out of adversity. After World War II, the greatest infrastructure project the world has ever known, the interstate highway system, was built. And Republicans and Democrats worked together to get it done. So I believe in improving bridges and roads and highways so we have connectivity in our state, so we can have connections. And I believe in infrastructure for a modern economy, high-speed internet that will access and allow access to all of our citizens to the highest technology and knowledge. My second point of my four-point plan is to double down on advanced manufacturing. Double down on it. Now, we've had great success in Lexington and literally in this region, but there are parts of our state that haven't had that success. And this is something I have a lot of experience in. Connecting our state, especially in eastern Kentucky and parts of western Kentucky, to the infrastructure that they need to grow and develop is essential. We need to work together, just like Louisville and Lexington have in the last six years with our BEAM project, the Bluegrass Economic Advancement Movement, for all of Kentucky. And third, we need to build the middle class and create better jobs. I'll be an advocate, I'll be an advocate for equal pay for equal work. People deserve a good wage. I am proud that Gray Construction is an employee-owned company, and I can tell you it has helped our business grow. And we must invest in education. Now, fourth, we have to help our small businesses and entrepreneurs. My dad started Gray Construction in 1960 with a $25,000 SBA Small Business Administration loan. 
We need to make sure that others can get this kind of help and create businesses that help America grow without enormous red tape. I know it didn't take him in 1960. It didn't. He got through this, this loan with a lot more ease than anybody could get through with it today. So I'll work with whoever is president to remove the red tape and get this done. Now, I want to turn to national security. I've learned as mayor the importance of public safety. That's why it's been my number one priority since taking office. My administration has invested far more in public safety than ever in the city's history. And while everything's certainly not perfect, Lexington is recognized as the safest city of our size in America today. We need the same sense of security across the country and a sense of urgency in Washington. Too many politicians talk about the importance of keeping our country safe while taking little action. And that's not how I work. My goal as a U.S. Senator is simple, to be constructive and be a part of solving Kentucky's biggest challenges, and to do that, we must have a safe and secure country. We start by securing the border and passing common sense immigration reform. Why are we allowing suspected terrorists to legally buy guns in the U.S.? As we continue to see new attacks at home and abroad, we must move forward with an unwavering commitment to defeating ISIS. This is a fight our country can win, but it takes using every means at our disposal to get ahead of the terrorists. We need increased airstrikes, cut off their money, confront the online threats, and increase resources to monitor lone wolf threats. We must give our intelligence community the tools they need to keep us safe. It is often that simple. Senator Paul tried to shut down our country's ability to find and stop terrorists. That is unacceptable. America is the strongest nation in the world, and we must stay that way. Now let me shift and talk about the budget, particularly as it relates to national defense. While cutting waste is a priority, it should be done carefully, just like we did in Lexington when we inherited and fixed a $30 million deficit. Broad cuts to national defense and shrinking the military like Senator Paul has proposed are careless and dangerous. America needs a strong, efficient, modern defense program with a budget to match. We must make intelligent investments in our military and intelligence systems to keep us safe. America is the leader in the free world, and I believe in a strong and vigorous role for the United States to shape the course of world events. A strong and vigorous global economy is best for America. Earlier I said that a 1 to 1.5% 1 growth is not sufficient. We need a 3% GDP growth in America, and that's the way the middle class will rise. Now, I am not an isolationist. I don't believe in a small, weak America. I believe in an America that is strong, an America that takes our rightful place of leadership in the world, not leading from behind, but leading from the front of the line. It's essential that we continue to work with our longtime, longtime allies and partners to present a unified front against international threats and the dangers presented by terrorism. The United States cannot escape its responsibilities to secure a more peaceful and engaged world community. We must support efforts to ensure that we have a national security policy that is strategic, strong, and innovative. Now let me close, let me close things out and talk a little about right here at home and how it easily actually translates into Washington and getting things done for our country. I've got two banners hanging in the mayor's office. Some of you may have been there. And those banners, both of those banners have the same thing on them. They say, create jobs, run government efficiently, and build a great American city. 
And then it follows with get it done. Now, I will still say our purpose in our country is to create jobs and run government efficiently. The only thing I'd change from build a great American city is let's build a great Kentucky and let's build a great America. I would finish with the same, very same three words, let's get it done. Don't just talk about it, let's get it done. Thank you all very much. Give us your depth of knowledge. Tell us everything you know. Oh, great. <laughs> about how we can fix the Middle East crisis. Talk oh, about ISIS a little bit and discuss where we are going with our country as regards the terrorist threat. Well, I said earlier, Alan, that we've got to do, we have to dial up our, all of our efforts. All of our efforts. We must give our intelligence community all the resources it needs to fight terrorism. This is new to all of us, but it's a threat to everyone as well. When we look at the history of this issue, my opponent has actually been characterized by his colleagues as having more, having done more to compromise the intelligence network of our country than any other senator. Now that's not acceptable. This is a time, now we're spending over half a billion dollars a year defense spending. Senator Paul has recommended cutting that budget by as much as 30 percent. You do that and we're not going to be able to fight ISIS. There have been considerations about even declaring war on ISIS. Those considerations, that needs to be considered. But we, as a country, must come together to recognize that the resources are required. And that means innovation. That means thinking strategically. That means supporting our allies in the Middle East. It's not acceptable, in my view, uh, let's look at Israel, for example. Israel today is receiving about $3 billion in foreign aid from America. That's allowed Israel to build what's called the Iron Dome, a defense system that has prevented missiles from hitting that country. If Israel didn't have the support of America, Israel, our strongest ally in the Middle East, would not be able to maintain its defense system. So simply put, it's America's role in the world, it's our historic role in the world, and we must, we must stand up for that role. We must protect ourselves. Mayor, where do you stand on the Department of Labor's overtime, the minimum salary change that's due in December? You know, there's been a lot of conversation about that. Um, our company has already begun adjusting to it. Our city has already become, has already started adjusting to it. Uh, I've seen changes over my lifetime. I've seen changes in, for example, the minimum, we've seen changes in the minimum wage. I remember when it was a dollar and a quarter an hour. Um, Lexington has made adjustments on the minimum wage. Now, I know some folks in this room don't agree with that. And that's America, that's the way democracy works. But our city council supported it. A majority of the city council supported raising and increasing the minimum wage up to $10.10 an hour. Now that's a role that the federal government should have adopted. That's a responsibility, has been historically. That way it'd be a level playing field across the country. But in terms of the overtime, uh, I, think comp I think that we'll adjust and we'll adapt. And that, at the end of the day, Alan, it's all about a rising middle class. We know uh, between, between 1992 and 2000, median household income in America rose from $42,000 to $56,000 a year. Between 2002 and 2012, it actually declined to $51,000 a year. It's just now getting back up 
to $56,000, $57,000 a year. America is built on a rising middle class. That's the promise of America. And we've got to do, we've got to do what it takes in order to preserve those dreams. That's essential for all of us, for all of us in business, for all of us in all professions. Yes, sir. This is a burning question that I've gotten from at least 12 people here. What do we have to do to beat Alabama? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm not going to go into sports. <laughs> That would be really dangerous. <laughs> you said stick on the federal level. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Mayor, what are your thoughts on changing regulations that, Amer that hinder American companies from bring bringing cash back from overseas and their operations there? Well, I would, I would, I would, agree, with, um, I would agree with considering all of, these op all of the opportunities to, uh, to repatriate. Um, I think it's, I think too much American money is held overseas, and I think we need to work together, the Congress needs to work together to find ways to encourage that those monies returning to America. Because what I do know is that capital can create jobs. Now, I'm glad you used the word regulations, because uh, I sometimes dial back to Mark Twain when I think about regulations in business, and I deal with a lot of them in our industry and in the city. Uh, Mark Twain once said that too much of a good thing is a bad thing, except in the case of Kentucky bourbon, in which case too much is just enough. All right, so regulations have that influence. Uh, too much can be a bad thing. I dealt with that in the construction industry. And I remember, for example, when OSHA was first initiated and uh, safety on our job sites was a, big, was a big deal. And we were all upset about it because we would often say, you know, construction's a dangerous industry. But then we had a different, we, we actually changed the point of view because we were exposed to Toyota and when we built the Toyota plant. And Toyota's production system is based, fundamentally based on a safe work environment. The reason I'm telling this story is because it has everything to do with regulations. And we realized then that in our own company, from learning from Toyota, that creating a safe workplace, we'd very likely, because we created the safest workplace in our industry, we'd very likely hire better people. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, we decided that we were going to exceed OSHA regulations. We did that. I've also found in the construction industry, and I'm, this is what I'm getting at, is that a proper level of regulation is good for capitalism. A proper level, because it levels the playing field. A proper level. We found in the construction industry there's something called the National Building Code, and then states also have building codes. But I can tell you that I'd rather have the National Building Code and a level playing field where everyone is playing by the same rules than have buildings collapsing like they are in Pakistan, or bridges and roads failing and collapsing like they do in India. So my shrink wrapping that, um, regulations can be the best, often what's useful for capitalism to prosper. Too much is not good, and I would push back and fight against red tape and regulation, I've done it. I've done it at, both at the city level as mayor, and I've done it in my own business. So too much can be a bad thing. But I think there is, uh, and one of the underreported things about Congress is that there is compromise happening, and there's bipartisanship happening all the time. You just have to look for it. Part of the reason you don't see it is we live in a world where the media wants to report contention as opposed to conciliation. So, for example, if you watch your evening news every night, a third, 20, 30 percent of the broadcast will be violence and crime. And yet it's about one to two percent of the public committing crimes and one to two percent of the time. Most of us live uh, our entire life free of crime. I'm not saying there's no crime, but I think there's a disproportionate amount of it on the media. Same way with the reporting of Congress. It seems to me it's all contention. I've never had a crossword with a Democrat up there. I'm not just saying that. 
I have had a crossword with a Republican or two. And so actually the, the words that I've seen more heated have been sort of within the family, within the caucus of the Republican Party. But um, as far as bipartisanship, most people who are trying to get a bill done actually try to get somebody on the other side. And so when we have issues that don't seem to be that partisan, or when we have an issue where we can find a part of the issue that's not partisan, we actually uh, are able to get some things done. This summer, you know, the discussion over the heroin outbreak uh, has consumed not only people in Kentucky, but New Hampshire, Ohio, many different states, and we actually did get something done. Wasn't very partisan, Republicans and Democrats both supported it. Uh, we worked to get a provision in it that was actually included in the final legislation, and that was to expand the amount of patients that doctors could see who need treatment. And um, so I think we do get together and do things. And uh, two weeks before I came down here, or two weeks ago now, uh, before we left session, I worked with Chris Murphy. And um, I think you'll find that people work together who don't agree on a lot but find a, a point of agreement. He and I don't agree on gun control. He's the leading face of gun control. But he is also somebody who agrees with me that we uh, shouldn't continue blithely selling arms to Saudi Arabia that we're in the middle of a war in Yemen now and most of the American public doesn't know it. American jets are refueling Saudi bombers, we're providing the bombs, and we're picking the targets in Yemen. How many people here knew we were at war in Yemen? If you were refueling the planes, picking the targets, and you have people on the ground, you are at war. Shouldn't we have a debate over this? The Constitution says that the authority to go to war comes from Congress. I mean, they were very explicit. They discussed this ad nauseum. Every one of the founding fathers was in agreement. It was one of these powers they were going to take away from the king, and it was one of these powers they were worried. They did not want the president to have this unilateral authority. We're supposed to have a debate. Why? Because just to say something is in our national interest is a conclusion. But certainly there ought to be a debate. And if you want to talk about great ironies, during the debate over whether or not we should provide bombs, more bombs for Saudi Arabia, we also passed legislation saying that the 9-11 victims can sue Saudi Arabia for involvement in 9-11. So at the same time, the majority, the vast majority of Congress and the Senate thinks that they have some suspicion Saudi Arabia was involved in 9-11, we're still selling them bombs. During President Obama's administration, he sold $100 billion worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia. The one thing that is for sure as you travel throughout the Middle East is that you will see U.S. weapons, often on both sides of the equation. The other day when Turkey invaded into Syria, they rolled in with U.S. tanks. Who was the first uh, people they encountered and the first people they decided to fight? The Kurds with our weapons. The other day, just north of Aleppo, there's a little town called Morea. In that town, you had Pentagon-backed Kurds fighting CIA-backed Syrian moderates. We're on both sides of often the battles and the wars throughout there. Why are we giving Saudi Arabia all these weapons or selling them? Because they're worried that Iran's getting stronger. How's Iran getting stronger? We released, you know, $100 billion that they're now using to buy conventional weapons. It sounds like an arms race, and we're right in the middle of all of it. We have a refugee crisis over there because of a war. Everybody's like, where do you put the refugees? Well, why don't we try to have less war? Why don't we try to figure out an arrangement to the war? Why don't we try to figure out some kind of end to this? How did the war start? The war started from a misguided notion. And the other night, you know, in the presidential debate, Trump got sidetracked on was he for or against it on the Howard Stern show. My goodness. You know, the whole point is whether you were for or against the Iraq war, have we learned anything from the Iraq war? Did we learn a lesson from the Iraq war? Here's the lesson I learned, that when you get rid of a secular dictator, someone who's been an iron fist in that area, you get chaos. And if you're hopeful they're going to elect Thomas Jefferson over there, you're, you're foolish, misguided, and naive. Thomas Jefferson doesn't exist over there. One of the miracles of the American Revolution was that we didn't descend into chaos. Why? Because we kept our religion, we kept our common law, and we had a 600-year history of assembly and of trying to limit the power of the king. See, I mean, this, this wasn't just America in, in England from, you know, uh, Magna Carta on, 1215 on. There was this movement to limit the king. The Middle East knows none of that. They know despot to despot, and that's usually what happens. But as we toppled Hussein, you got a vacuum. In that power vacuum, you had chaos. We won the war. 
And yet the people who took over are more friendly now with Iran than they are us. You've got a sectarian government. It's all Shiites that run the government. They booted the Sunnis out of the government. They booted the Sunnis out of, out of uh, the army. So what happened when ISIS rolled in? The mum said, well, you know, ISIS is part, they're part of our religion, and we, maybe we'll see how they are, but we know we hate the people in Baghdad and we hate the Iranians. So all of the areas occupied by ISIS are Sunni areas. And so you, you have sort of this chaos that came from getting rid of a, 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 a dictator or a despot in, in Hussein. But that should be the lesson we should learn. But who has been the biggest advocates of toppling Assad in Syria, toppling Mubarak in Egypt, or toppling Gaddafi in Libya? Hillary Clinton, John McCain. You say, oh, they're, no, no, they're different. They're the opposite. No, they're the same. It's the same failed foreign policy that says that we should always intervene, and it's always our job to intervene. Problem is, none of them seem to be learning the lesson of unintended consequences. The unintended consequences of pushing Assad back have been that ISIS grew stronger. ISIS rides around in a billion dollars worth of our Humvees. They just simply, we didn't give them to them, but they simply took them. So when we flood weapons into there, we need to know who our friends are. Frankly, the Kurds are our friends, but we don't give weapons directly to the Kurds. We give them to the Shiite government in Baghdad, who doles them out sparingly to the Kurds. ISIS is about 25,000 people, 25,000 soldiers. The Turks have 600,000. The Peshmerga have about 190,000. Baghdad government has about 190,000. Jordanians have a couple hundred thousand, and the Israelis have a million. They're surrounded. We can't beat 25,000 people. Somehow we think American troops have to do this. If we send American troops back into the Middle East, let's say we send 100,000 troops back, how long will it take to defeat ISIS? Three days, probably, because they will simply run. They're not going to fight us in a contested battle. But if we do that, have we won the war, or have they slithered off into the shadows only to come back? This is an ideology. It's an aberration. And there have been people who've written about this. Thomas Friedman, I don't agree on a lot, but he talked about the idea of containment and amplification of our allies. Let's amplify our allies, but ultimately let's see if civilized Islam, with some help maybe, can defeat this aberration. The reason is, is that if you want an ultimate victory and an ultimate peace, they look at us and they say, we're pagans, we're the evil Satan, you know. We, we are not somebody they're going to accept defeat from. They have to, have, they have to ultimately be defeated by their co-religionists, by other, other, other people of the Islamic faith. And I think Islam needs to do this also, to show that this doesn't represent their faith. But it's a big deal, and to me it's a big deal that we not get involved in war without first having a debate in Congress and first having a vote. There's a young captain in the military right now who's suing over taking an order because it says in the military justice or in the armed services manual that you don't have to obey, you know, your first, your first oath is to the Constitution. And you, don't have to do, you don't have to obey a, an unlawful order. Well, he doesn't know whether it is or isn't, so he's suing in court to find out. I don't know if the court will hear him, but it's a reasonable question. We should debate these things. I had a conversation with President Obama directly on this about a year and a half ago when he started unleashed the bombs that he and Hillary Clinton supported in Libya. I said, one of the things I liked about President Obama was that when he ran in 2007, he said, no president should unilaterally go to war without the authority of Congress, unless we're under imminent attack. And I agree with that. I mean, if people are launching missiles at us, the president has the right to respond immediately. You have to have that. That's an unusual circumstance. And when we've been attacked, most presidents have come almost immediately, or they used to historically. When we were attacked uh, at, at Pearl Harbor, Within a day, I think the next day, FDR asked for a declaration of war and Congress gave it to him unanimously. When we were attacked on 9-11, I think it took a few weeks till we actually did a declaration of war or initiation of, of force, but we voted nearly unanimously in 9-11. So uh, we have to do this because, one, war is a terrible thing. You know, war shouldn't be entered into, you know, without full thought and full discussion. It should be the last resort, not the first resort. And really, when I look at my job, I think it's the most important thing I do, is trying to make the decision whether we go to war or not, and thinking about our soldiers and what they will suffer and have suffered. One young man in the neighboring town in Bowling Green that my wife and I and others helped to build a house, he lost both legs and an arm. And so when he went to war, he fought for us, for the Bill of Rights, for the Constitution. You know, I can't have enough respect for that 
but it's also our job while they're gone to defend the Constitution and not to be so fearful of 25,000 people that we give up our liberty while they're gone. You know, some say, well, we can't catch those terrorists. We can't catch them unless we give up our liberty. Unless we let the government look at all of our phone information, we can't stop them. I don't think that's true. I think the Constitution does work. I think warrants work. Ask any of the judges here in the community how often they turn down warrants. Warrants are most of the time granted. If someone is uh, out and about 3 in the morning and they think there's a rapist in a house and the police call the judge, how often do you think the judge says no? Almost never. And I'm for the judge saying to go in. But I'm also for the step of the police actually calling the judge. Police all obey the Fourth Amendment. There's not one policeman in your community that will go into a house without permission. If they do, the evidence won't be used and it won't be worthwhile. So I think we can have our liberty, can have the Constitution, and can also at the same time uh, defend ourselves from terrorism. As far as what are we doing with domestic policy, I would say the biggest problem we still face is our debt. And in some ways, I think it's interconnected with national security. You can't be a strong nation. You can't defend yourself if you're wallowing in debt. We have a $20 trillion debt. We borrow a million dollars a minute. And Admiral Mullen said that the greatest threat to our national security is actually our debt. I think that's true. I think you can get to the point where you're overextended to such a degree that you're not able to defend yourself. And we do have to worry about that. So I, I put out weekly uh, a waste report. Anybody wants to be on that can sign up through our official government account. And we put out a waste report to tell people, you know what, there is a lot of waste. I put forward a bill to give government employees bonuses if they'll find savings. We right now have the opposite. When you get to the last month of the fiscal year, government employees spend money five times faster than any other month. It's called use it or lose it. Because if you've got a $12 million budget and you only spend $11 million, they might not give you the full budget the next year. So you're just like, well, I might as well spend the whole $12 million. That's why you see conferences in Las Vegas in the last month of the year. And the money spent five times faster. In fact, the money gets spent faster as the day goes on. On September 30th, when the, when the doors open in the East Coast, the spending begins. And it's a flurry of spending. As you go across the continent, it's chasing the sun. At 5 o'clock in California, they're spending the money as rapidly as they can. They're shoveling it out the door. And you'd be amazed at what it's spent on. So I've tried to give the reverse incentive. I think they have a perverse incentive now. I've tried to give them the same incentive you have in business to say, you know what? If you save money for your boss, you'll probably get a bonus. You'll at least get a pat on the back. Luther, I'm sure, would give you a bonus if you save money for him. But I think that uh, we need to look at ways to reform it and not do the same old, same old. If we say, well, are there, you know, I said we get along quite a bit. Are there partisan differences? Sure there are. And it's almost, um, I think, universal. There are, and I, I hate to be frank about this, there are no Democrats for reducing regulations in Washington. Dodd-Frank. Republicans would almost uniformly repeal the Dodd-Frank bank banking regulations, or at the very least repeal as many as we could. We don't have one vote in the Senate from Democrats to do that. Um, on taxes, we would lower taxes. We want a smaller federal government, and we want more money left in Lexington. There's not one Democrat in Washington that will lower taxes. They're so worried and concerned about making sure people are adequately punished and people are paying more in taxes. Let's get those rich people. The rich people pay the taxes. The top 1% pay a third of the income tax. The top 10% pay 60% of the income tax. These are just facts. And the thing is, is do we not understand that coveting our neighbor's property isn't a good, good feeling, isn't something that's good for us? What we should be spreading is this, this uh, gospel of hope to every young kid out there that you could be Bill Gates. You could be a, a, you know, a success if you work hard in school. But it shouldn't be that we're spreading this philosophy of your neighbor has three cars, send the government to get one of their cars from them. You know, uh, the politics of envy is not a good thing. We shouldn't say the pie is this big, go grab what you can now, send your representative to get what you can from other people. No, let's make the pie this big. We've done it before. When we did it under Reagan, it was reduction of taxes. We didn't shrink government, we should have, so the debt did, did, did increase. We should do both, shrink government size, shrink the tax rates, and let's see if we can prosper. Reagan took the rates from 90% personal to 70, no, no, from 70 to 50, and from 50 to 28. But now we've been creeping the other way. We're up to about, the top 1% are paying about 44% before you get to their state tax. 
44%, is that not enough? Maybe we ought to look at whether we have too much government before we say we want to just stick it to rich people or stick it to corporations. It is not healthy to say we want to punish corporations. Do you know who owns corporations? Teachers, firemen, policemen. I always kind of joke that I, um, I'm not in an uh, uh, organization that has a pension. I'm not rich enough, so I can't get in one of these private equity funds. But they own Apple Computer. They own all of our corporations. You may not own a lot of it, but if you're a teacher, you own some of Apple. We don't want to punish Apple. We don't want to punish corporations so they leave our country. We have the highest corporate income tax in the world, 35%. I'd lower it to 15 or below immediately. Canada's 15. Ireland's 12. There's not one Democrat that'll do that for us. And I hate to make it partisan, but I want you to know what happens in Washington. There is a partisan divide on taxes. There is a partisan divide on regulations. It's not just the war, of coal, war on coal, which is unanimously done by Democrats in Washington. It's not just the war on the family farm, which is waters of the US, which is now having the federal government regulate the farm in Kentucky. That's unanimously the other party. The war on the banks, the same thing. The war on hospitals, the war on doctors. All of the regulatory war is coming from one side in this country. So you have to decide if that's what you want, it's gonna be a shrinking pie. Go grab what you can and elect people who grab some for you. But that's not what I want. I want to protect your liberty, I want you to be free, and I want you to prosper. Every community I go to in Kentucky, I say, what is your business? What can I do to allow you to make more money? And it's like, why, is it because I like rich people? No, I want, the people to, I want the people who own the businesses to hire people. I want everybody to prosper. And it isn't a zero-sum game. It isn't if my neighbor prospers, I won't. We can all prosper if we realize and value the system that our founding fathers gave us. We are the richest, the freest, and the most humanitarian country ever in the history of mankind. In 2014, we gave away, not the government, but you as individuals gave away nearly $400 billion in charity. $400 billion to your churches and charities. That doesn't happen in Cuba. Doesn't happen in Venezuela. We have candidates. The main candidate opposite Hillary Clinton on the other side was for socialism. He calls it democratic socialism, but socialism's an utter failure in history. Socialism leads to poverty, and it inherently involves violence and death. It's not an accident that Stalin killed 37 million people, Mao killed 60 million people, Pol Pot killed 10 million people. When you give too much power to one person, and that's what socialism is, inevitably it leads to tragedy. It was Madison who said that where power resides, there lies the greatest danger. To me, it's about trying to decentralize power, bring power back to the states, bring power back to the local community, bring power to the individual. But we need to divide it up and understand that the concentration of power in Washington is too great, whether it's in Republican or Democrat hands. And no matter who is elected, if there's a Republican elected in November, you'll find that I will be critical of too much power wherever it resides. And I'm running for re-election. If you'll have me again, I'm going to keep trying to defend your liberty, keep taxes low, balance the budget, and defend the Constitution. Thank you. But just to kind of kick us off, talk a little bit about the economy, and it's the number one issue in this election season, and we're seeing 1% to 2% economic growth. Is that the new normal, or do you think there are some things that could be done to get economic growth back up to where we'd like it to be? Well, if, if you're in a business, you have the cost of doing business, you know, things you buy, the, uh, your labor, et cetera. Well, two costs of doing business that are governmental are taxes and regulation. You have a $3 trillion tax burden every year, and you have a $2 trillion regulatory burden. And so the regulatory burden, we've got to do something about, and the tax burden. We have to be competitive with other countries. We're growing at about 1%. But part of the reason we're languishing is corporations want to leave our country. And so that's why we have to be very, very careful about this. I hate American corporations and I hate American business uh, group of people because if we succumb to that, sort of this politics of class warfare, those companies will simply leave. Burger King reincorporated in Canada. New software startup companies are going to Canada because it's a 15% tax up there. Ireland's 12%. 
So we do have to be concerned about it. 1% should not be the new normal. 3% was what we had sort of on average. In one of Reagan's years, we had 7% nominal growth, though. So we can grow even more rapidly. For each percentage point of growth, it's about a million jobs. So we're about 2 million jobs shy. We also have a whole host of young people graduating from college with college debt who either aren't getting the job they want or aren't getting a job that pays what they want, but that's an underperforming economy. But that's a debate you have as a people. Do you think that you grow more if we raise taxes? Do you think you'll grow more if we have more regulations? And really, it's a pendulum. Nobody's talking about no taxes. Nobody's talking about no regulation. We're talking about what is reasonable. And I think if reasonable is here, I think we're way over here on the unreasonable side as far as regulations. You know, look at what um, the goal of President Obama and Hillary Clinton have been on coal. Their goal on coal was not health and safety. It was bankruptcy. President Obama said he would bankrupt coal, and he's almost done it. Hillary Clinton says we're going to put your miners out of business. You know, so I think we have to decide what is the role of government. Can we have some regulation? Sure. I'm not against some regulations on the smokestack. We've had some for 50 years, and the emissions on the smokestack have gone out for 50 years for coal. So uh, but we just can't go over the top. And right now, I think we're over the top on the regulatory burden. You touched a little bit uh, on this with the combination of the EPA policies and the decline in, in Kentucky coal have led to some uncertainty and some concern about what our future coal uh, electric prices will be in Kentucky. What do you think Washington can do to help um, ensure that Kentucky maintains affordable electricity prices for residents, but also for our manufacturing that, that depends so much on electricity? I would repeal all of uh, President Obama's war on coal regulations. That's the first thing we ought to do. And I think you'd then see competitive prices here again in Kentucky. But the bigger problem, other than just coal, is that the regulatory agencies have become a fiefdom or like a kingdom unto themselves. And so with, like with the banking regulations, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we don't even fund it. Congress doesn't fund it. When they come to testify to us, they simply laugh if we ask them questions because we can't do anything to them. We can't defund them. We can't do anything to try to modulate their behavior. They're completely independent of Congress. That's a problem. They get their money from the Federal Reserve, and there's already an arrogance and officialdom and over, overwrought uh, and overwhelming regulations coming from them, and they've just been in business a couple years. If we get eight years of Clinton and a CFPB without any kind of congressional oversight, I, I, I shudder to think what happens in the end. But the EPA, the same thing. So this clean power plant thing, that uh, regulation they passed on utilities, that was done without our permission, without a vote of Congress. And so it's, it's thousands of pages long. Immigration law, which the court stopped yesterday, President Obama, and we can, I have, I'm very open to the discussion on immigration. We can figure out an immigration policy for our country, but it shouldn't be done by one person. President Obama decided that four to five million people would not be under the immigration law that currently says what they've done is illegal in coming to the country. Well, he just can't do that. We can debate whether we want that as a people, but he should not be allowed to do that on his own. That's what's going on with the regulatory war, is they're doing whatever they want. So it used to be co-equal branches of government, and you know Madison said we'd pit ambition against ambition, so we'd have checks and balances. Now the presidency's a thousand-fold greater than Congress. And that's the regulatory agencies are under the president. Didn't happen just with this president. Republicans have done it also. We need to rebalance the power equation in Washington and make the branches co-equal again.